Right. Good afternoon, everyone. So, after lunch, trying to keep awake to continue to do so <laughs> because we have got a, a sort of change of gears and something quite exciting coming up uh, with uh, Professor Saikat Guha from the University of um, Arizona, who's on. I was going to talk to us about quantum tensor networks, and he is sort of the key man behind building large quantum networks in the US. So let's listen to him. Thank you very much, Anil. Uh, thanks, Kasturi, for inviting me here and all the other organizers. So I'll, I'll try my best to uh, do my part of keeping you all awake. Um, and uh, what I have decided to do, I made these slides after I heard both uh, Sai's lectures and uh, Carl's lectures. Uh, you will hear a little bit of a repetition in terms of the the fundamental tools behind sensing and metrology, but I'll take a bend on where we will be doing some math and actually applying the tools on some problems. Um, so my first lecture today will be focused on um, uh, developing some of those tools and applying it to some problems in uh, photonic uh, sensing. Um, and then uh, we will look at what you can do when you have multiple sensors that are working together to accomplish a task together. Um, and in my second lecture, we will be talking about, about a very specific application um, of uh, quantum uh, estimation theory tools for determining fundamental limits of passive imaging. We are looking at uh, resolving stars, for example, in astronomy or trying to resolve uh, emitters in a fluorescence microscopy setting. My name is Saikat Guha. I'm at the University of Arizona's College of Optical Sciences. Um, and uh, our, we are located in a, a city called Tucson in Arizona. If you, let's see if this progresses. Uh, all right, yeah, yeah it works. Um, so uh, Tucson is a city about um, 100 miles south of Phoenix, very close to the Mexico border. Um, the College of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona, and uh, there's another college focused in optics and photonics in Rochester. So these are the two big centers, uh, institutions in the US where pretty much every single area of optics and photonics is represented, all the way from say high power lasers to nonlinear optics, quantum optics, Bose-Einstein condensates, every area of optics. Um, at the University of Arizona, we are, um, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about the Center for Quantum Networks that Anil pointed out, but I will not be talking about networking, but that's a huge focus right now within our quantum information science and engineering uh, effort. So these are the faculty members and we are a growing team. And this last year, we launched a, a master's program in quantum information science and engineering. And uh, we expect to offer uh, that online or at least parts of that online at some point. And I'll keep the organizers posted if there is interest in this community. Uh, so let me say, tell a few words about the Center for Quantum Networks and then I'll dive into the topic for today on uh, quantum metrology um, and sensing. So this center is funded um, as part of the National Science Foundation's uh, Engineering Research Center program. There's a program called the ERC, which started in the 1980s. And the objective of that program was to take uh, a technology area that is right at the point where a 10 year long, highly, highly transdisciplinary push can take it to a point where that technology could be ready for, for further acceleration. Uh, by the industry and, and by the society. So um, this is the first quantum program as, that was funded as part of the ERC this was about three years ago. And it's a full stack quantum networking effort with the objective of uh, delivering fault tolerant entanglement among distant locations while serving multiple applications simultaneously. So just like the internet supports many applications like the Zoom call happening right now and the, the VOIP and, and lots of different things happening, email simultaneously, the quantum network should be supporting entanglement delivery for so long based like telescopes and Eckert 91 session and maybe a blind quantum computation session, all of those simultaneously. So we have people working all the way from quantum memory physics, to spin photon interfaces to have the memories transfer their qubits into the photonic domain and vice versa. Uh, quantum error correction to distill entanglement across a single hop. Uh, and then doing quantum logic at the memory nodes using uh, nuclear spin assisted hyperfine logic on color center based quantum memories. And many of these terms may not mean a lot to you, but I'll just, uh, I'll talk about some of these technologies a little bit later. And then ultimately once you have long distance entanglement, 
uh, uh, we are looking at uh, developing routing algorithms, scheduling algorithms, network tomography algorithms. And these are people who are working on uh, computer network theory. So it's uh, all the way from physics to computer science. So if you're interested in learning more about our work in quantum networking, definitely feel free to reach out to me. But with that, I will um, switch to our uh, topic of discussion today. So to me, uh, this whole field of quantum uh, enhanced or quantum inspired or quantum uh, assistive sensing uh, boils down to the fact that you know, light and matter are they're fundamentally quantum mechanical objects. Uh, even classical light that we are seeing around us, there is a quantum state description of this light. It's a, it's a, it's a Romain phase insensitive multimode Gaussian state. I mean, it's thermal light. It's a, it's a fancy way of saying thermal light, but but once you cast light in the quantum mechanical language, you suddenly have access to some very, very powerful tools um, that allow you to do quantum treatment of information embedded in that light uh, and help you understand what is the best possible precision with which you can measure certain quantities. Now, what does best mean? So th that, that, that word best, uh, has to be qualified. What is your measure for precision? Are you trying to tell apart between a few different states of light? Uh, are you trying to estimate a parameter embedded in a, in a, in a, in a pulse of light? Um, are you trying to track how a parameter changes in time? Um, are you trying to do a hypothesis test between one known thing that you are trying to discriminate between absolutely anything else? And all of those things that I just told, tell, told you about, and there are more in the context of communications, there are different quantum information, quantum estimation theoretic tools that tell you if that's the parameter you care about, how should you measure that information bearing light in order to get the best possible, best possible precision for that definition of best. So that's, that's about the whole field of quantum information theory applied to photons. Now, another thing that I, I think it's very important to understand, and we have heard this in all of the talks in the last couple of days, but I still wanted to stress it. There's no way to evade uh, measurement noise. You know, there's no matter how you choose to measure your light, um, there will be a fundamental noise. I'm not talking about uh, you know, excess noise, but there's something called short noise, or there's a quantum limited noise. Even when you are measuring uh, squeezed light, there's a minimum amount of noise that, that quantum mechanics says that you have to add. So all of this entire field of quantum metrology, to me, it is, it, it is a whole field that, that, that looks at how can you engineer that noise to your advantage by perhaps doing something to the optical domain information before you subject to that inevitable noise. Perhaps you would position that information in that light in a more favorable way to that inevitable noise that is yet to come. So that is about, uh, that, that's how you design optimal receivers or optimal measurement strategies. So these quantum metrology tools uh, give us the fundamental limits of precision, but as uh, uh, you know, Carl also pointed out in his talk that oftentimes, even though these quantum metrology tools give you a hint at how do you, you would design a scheme that will actually get those limits, that going from understanding the fundamental limits to finding out that that measurement strategy is often very, very difficult. Um, and that itself is, is a science and art on its own right. And we will see some examples of those today. Okay, so with that prelude um, about my philosophy about the field, let me tell, give you an outline of what I'm going to do. So you will hear me talk about a whole bunch of bounds. You heard from both Sai and Carl about the Kramer-Rao bound. We talk about other Bayesian bounds and estimation theory, Hellstrom bound, Chernoff bound, Holevo bound, and all of these different bounds, they talk about you know, uh, uh, understanding what is the best possible precision for a particular definition of the word best. You define what you, what you want, what you care about. So in today's lecture, I will start with some, uh, some primer on estimation theory. I will take a more practice bend where we will be actually doing some math um, and doing some calculations. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the quantum description of light, and then I will launch into applications. First, the applications will be on um, uh, you know, individual sensors, and then I will go into network of sensors. And depending upon where we finish today, uh, with that one and a half hour mark, I will, might not cross the line right here. It either I might spill over or leave something for the next lecture. So we'll, we'll see how far we go. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we, I'll first start with estimation theory, um, and uh, uh, I would I'll, I'll put some pictures on on um, of various hikes my group loves to do in the Tucson area. And people who have visited my group, they know that we would we take them out on hikes too. So if you if you wish to come to Tucson, uh, we would love to take you out. You know, see these um, these cactuses. These are um, called the saguaro cactus. If you haven't seen them. They are um, they grow up to 20 feet or so high, and uh, they live for more than 200 years. In fact, people who are experts on them, they can look at the, you know, the, uh, the different widths of these cactuses along, the, along its height, and they know which year Tucson got how much uh, rainfall. Um, so they're absolutely gorgeous uh, scenery. So let's uh, talk about estimation theory, classical estimation theory in this very, very basic, simple construct. X is my parameter of interest, but what you actually see is Y, which is a noisy version of X. And you know P of Y given X. Okay? And you know P of Y given X perhaps because you know where X comes from and what measurement you have choose, chosen and Y is the output of your measurement. Your job is to estimate X. And let's take the, uh, the what I call the Fisherian point of view, where X is a fixed parameter that is what it is, but you don't know what it is. There is no prior probability distribution of it. It's called the frequentist approach. Now, if you really wanted to estimate X, what's the best Y you hope for? If Y equal to X, I mean, if, if it would be wonderful if Y was actually X and you could measure it, right? But then Y is a noisy version of X. So what you, the next best thing you do is that uh, you, from your probability distribution, you pick the value of X for the y that you just got, you pick that value of x for which this probability distribution p of y given x is the highest. Seems like the most obvious natural thing to do. And uh, this estimator of x, and I'm using the, the hat, so I use the inverted hat, so it's the same thing. Um, this is called the maximum likelihood estimator. And it's the most common sense estimator, but it also happens to be the estimator that minimizes the variance of that estimator. So it gives you the best quality estimate of, of, that, um, of that parameter. Um, so this uh, maximum likelihood estimator, um, if you were to write down the variance of absolutely any estimator that you could get here from y, so estimator is simply a function that turns this y into your belief and estimate about x. And you might have n trials, meaning your same parameter x is going through multiple instances of this probabilistic channel to get you these different outcomes, y1, y2 to yn. And, and this y in general could be a vector. And the estimate is just one, let's say in this case, a scalar parameter that you are estimating. So absolutely any estimator satisfies this Fisher uh, information driven. Th this is the kramer rao bound inequality. Um, and, uh, there is a, so you saw some versions of this kramer rao bound where there was nothing in the numerator, there was one in the numerator. And I believe that Sai, you had uh, covered this bias term. Um, this M of X is the estimate, the, the expectation of the estimator. And if this M of X happens to be equal to the value of the parameter, then you have an unbiased estimator, in which case M is derivative M of, of M of X is one, so you get a one. N is the number of trials and J of X is the, is the Fisher information. Now let's stare at this Fisher information for a moment. And you have seen again, this written in multiple different ways in the last few days. Look at this quantity over here inside the square bracket. It's the derivative of the log of the probability distribution. Now, if, if Y, so this, this condition, this, the, this, this uh, log of P of Y given X, the, um, is, uh, this is called the, the derivative of that is called the score function by statisticians. If you get a Y, okay, and if you change your X, what kind of Y is a good Y to estimate X? A Y that actually changes as you change X, right? Because then you will be able to estimate X. So if you have a value of Y such that, the probability distribution P of Y given X doesn't change too much. It is not giving you as much information about X. So, so that's why if this partial derivative magnitude squared, if this thing is small, then that value of Y is not a good value of Y in terms of its ability to give you a good estimate of X. So that's why it seems reasonable that the expected value of that squared quantity, which quantifies the 
the goodness of that particular Y, to give you an estimate, uh, uh, est uh, expectation taken over the probability distribution of Y, given the value of X, should be a quantity that tells you on an average, uh, what is the amount of information that you're going to get from one sample of Y about X. Obviously, I just said it and Carl proved it, and so I also showed a proof for the quantum case, but that's the intuitive understanding of why Fisher information is, uh, it does what it does. If it's large, it means your variance uh, uh, scales more rapidly as n increases. Another thing that's important here is that the maximum likelihood estimator, if you were to plug in this estimator over here, as n increases to infinity, this bound is saturated, and I'll talk more about that. Okay, so now there is another view of the world that, that's called Bayesian estimation theory, where you have a prior probability distribution available on X. Maybe because you have a knowledge of the problem itself. Maybe you have made prior measurements that you have used to convert that to a prior probability distribution that you could leverage. Or maybe it is just the uh, setting of the problem setting that has been solved in the past that you have some reason to believe that you know something about X before even you start to measure it. Now, if you have a prior probability distribution, then the quantity that you care about minimizing is called the mean squared error. So I should have just written MSE, mean squared error. And this first M stands for the minimum mean squared error. So what I'm writing here is the this is the joint distribution of P of X and Y. So you have P of Y given X already given. P of X is also given. This is your prior. And this quantity is your squared error. And you are just taking an average over the joint distribution. So that's called the mean squared error. So your job is to find the estimator for, for X that minimizes that mean squared error. So what is that estimator? That estimator is given by the expected value of X given Y. So what you do to calculate this estimator, so if I give you a P of Y given X, and I give you a P of X, what you do is that you apply Bayes' rule to take these two and get P of X given Y. And I believe that you all here know the Bayes' rule, so you can go from P of Y given X to P of X given Y. And then if you think about what is P of X given Y, this is the probability that the parameter's value is X mm -hmm. given that you have observed Y. So it's actually probability distribution of X, like given Y. So if I had, if I integrate that X, times px, it's the average value of x, right? So this thing is the average value of x conditioned on the measurement outcome that you have gotten. And that is the MMSC estimator. So you can prove that if you use this as your estimator and plug it in here, the value of this mean squared error you would get is the minimum possible value you could have gotten. Now, even for classical estimation theory, this thing is actually not easy to calculate for all values of p of y given x. Uh, this estimator can also get very complicated to calculate. So people came up with bounds to this, and there's, there's many, many bounds to the, this MMSE. There's the uh, Van Trees bound, there's the Ziv Zakai bound, there's, there's many different bounds. This one that um, you learn in textbook uh, estimation theory, it's called the Bayesian Kramer-Rao bound, which is kind of a weird phrase. I mean, I don't like that at all. It's like Kramer-Rao bound is a Fisherian bound, which you're saying it's a Bayesian Kramer-Rao bound, but that's what it is called, it's called BCRB. And, and why is it called that? If you look at this JB, the expression for that, it looks identical to the, the, the Fisher information, except that you replace the conditional distribution by the joint distribution everywhere. This one by the joint distribution, this one by the joint distribution. And you can prove that one over the JB is a, low, is a, is a, is a, uh, is a lower bound to, to, the minimum, to the mean squared error. And the thing is that this BCRB is not saturable always, meaning there are problems that I'll show, for example, for which you calculate this bound and it's not tight. Okay, so this is all I'll talk about classical estimation theory. Now this, um, why care about quantum estimation? So as I, as I told you in the beginning, in my view, uh, quantum estimation theory or quantum information theory is just peeking a little bit inside where this P of Y given X comes from. Okay, so this P of Y given X, which is the, you know, the probabilistic description of a noisy channel, it's actually, uh, uh, it comes from a collection of two things. P of Y given X, uh, it comes from your quantum description of the information bearing, I'm saying light, it doesn't have to be light, it could be matter. So quantum description of the parameter that you care about and a POVM description of the measurement that you're using to generate an estimate of that parameter. 
So this P of Y given X is trace of rho of X times pi Y. This is the P of EM operator corresponding to the Yf outcome. Now, all of classical estimation theory from say Van Tree's book, it, it deals with P of Y given X. And quantum estimation theory, we take a peek inside and we say, well, rho of X is something that we can write down because we understand how to write down the quantum state of information bearing light. But we oftentimes, we don't want to make a guess on this measurement and quantum estimation theory tools like the quantum Fisher information, it can give you a Fisher information like bound uh, without even having to talk about that measurement. And it automatically optimizes over all possible measurement choices. And this is a common feature across all of these different quantum information, quantum estimation bound, the Holevo bound, the, the, the quantum Kramer Rao bound, the Hellstrom bound for minimum probability of error discrimination and so forth. So quantum estimation theory, again, with the Fisherian point of view, where you don't have any priors, the Fisher information uh, is, is replaced by uh, the quantum Fisher information. I'm not putting the bias term here, but you, you, there is a corresponding a bias term you can put there. This K of X, you want to write something like the classical Fisher information. You have seen derivations, like Carl showed you a derivation, for example. But if you, if you look at that quantity, that D DX of P of Y given X, uh, you want something that um, that replaces this thing, right? this log of P of Y given X. And if you look at this thing, uh, you know, it is, uh, what is it? It's a log, so it's a one over P of Y given X. Uh, and then log. So this thing, um, if you look at that, that quantity, that L of uh, rho of X squared, this thing is just a, a quantum version of something you would directly write instead of the probability distribution would write with respect to the rho. You write this operator L of, uh, L of rho of X such that it is, uh, if I were to take this on the other side, okay, if, if I wanted to have the square of this is what I need. So I just wrote it. So this squared is the is this thing is what I want to replace by this L of rho of x. And because I cannot divide by a density operator, I take the d dx of the p of i given x, I have a d dx of rho x on this side. And the left hand side, instead of being uh, just a multiplication by the probability, for technical reasons, you have to symmetrize this thing and uh, write this symmetric logarithmic derivative. But then it can actually solve for the SLD, for the symmetric logarithmic derivative operator that appears here that takes the role of this uh, score function. And you can write this in this very interesting way. Um, uh, and I think, Sai, you had derived this. Um, it goes as e to the minus rho of x times z. This is the derivative of rho of x with respect to x. And then again, e to the minus rho of x of z. So if you look at this, the quantum Fisher information, I never even specified the measurement choice. But then the point of the QFI is that this K of X will be always larger than or equal to J of X, no matter what measurement you pick. So it is an upper bound to the classical Fisher information. And not just that, if you pick a measurement, your measurement of this pi Y to be a projective measurement, that is defined by the eigenbasis of this SLD operator, which is implicitly defined by this equation or explicitly defined by that equation, and plug it in here, you will get a P of Y given X for which if you were to evaluate this equation, you will get K of X here. Meaning you can achieve the quantum Fisher information for a measurement choice, which is given by the eigenbasis of the SLD operator. And you have again heard this previously, but I just wanted to instill this important thing. And another thing to know is that this measurement choice is not the only measurement that will achieve the QFI. There are other measurements that will also achieve the QFI as you will see in some examples I'll talk about in passive imaging contexts. Now, just like classical, there is also a quantum version of the, um, the uh, Bayesian estimation theory. And uh, in Bayesian estimation theory, what happens is that you want to minimize the mean squared error, just like classical. And in this case, you can write down an explicit expression for the MMSE, uh, and uh, you define an operator, this operator B, 
that looks like the SLD operator. Look here, instead of the row, I have replaced this by the average value of rho with respect to the probability distribution P of X. So this, there are three operators here, gamma zero, is the average of rho of x over the p of x. Gamma one and gamma two are moment operators. Gamma one is x p x rho x dx, and gamma two is x squared p x rho x dx. And uh, this operator b, its eigenvectors, if you were to choose this as the measurement here, you will get a p of y given x, which if you go back and put into this expression and evaluate the MMSC estimator and put it back here, you will get the minimum possible mean squared error that quantum mechanics allows you for the given rho of x and p of x. And this expression was derived by Stupersonic in a paper in 1971 in IEEE transactions of information theory. It's a beautiful result. And uh, it again, people have st started looking at multi-parameter versions of that. And there is a multi-parameter um, uh, Bayesian bound that was developed recently. But for a single scalar parameter, in principle, uh, if you solve this operator equation, um, to get these gammas and then find B from this equation. You can put it here into this formula and you can derive the MMSE. And we have used that in the context of uh, passive imaging that I'll talk about in my next lecture. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about this though. This slide is the overview of all of estimation theory tools, but let's remember this expression for deficient information because we are gonna use that a little bit. So let's play with this uh, estimation a little bit more. So as I said that we'll define this log likelihood function L of Y and statisticians like to call the derivative of that the score function. So the score function is, you know, really, if this function this is small, it means that that value of y is not as sensitive to changes in x. Uh, let's massage this equation a little bit more. So I, as I defined the Fisher information as the average value of this L prime operator in my previous slide, right? So this is my definition of the Fisher information. So I'll take, take that definition. And now let's observe that if I were to look at this, um, the P prime in the numerator here, or the L prime is just P prime over P, right? So if you look at P prime, um, take the integral with respect to Y, and I'm going to assume I'm being sloppy here. I'm assuming that I can uh, you know, move around the derivative and the integral, which can't always do, but let's say I can do that. The derivative of this P of Y given X um, is obviously zero because this integrates to one. That's the probability distribution. Similarly, the double derivative also is zero because that integrates to one. So if I were to write the expected value of this L prime function where I treat Y as a random variable, uh, this is the expectation. Now, if I substitute the value of L prime from here, P prime over P, the P cancels out and the P prime integral is zero from here, right? So I have the expected value of uh, this L prime is zero, hence, the expected value of the squared of L prime is nothing but the variance of L prime, right? Because the variance of a random variable is the expected value of the square of the random variable, right? And then minus the square of the mean, the mean is zero in this case. So this is another formula that will sometimes come in handy. So let's remember that as well. That's the second way to write the Fisher information. And I'm gonna derive a third way to write the Fisher information and I'll, I'll continue after that to examples. Um, so uh, let's do a little bit more math here, a very simple math. I'm going to take that L of Y given X, that L prime function that I defined earlier. So this is L prime. Remember L prime is P prime over P. Let, let's take a derivative of that, one more derivative of that. So P prime over P, if I derivative with respect to X, what will I get? Uh, you apply the U by V rule. Okay, so P double prime P minus P prime squared over P of Y given X squared. And you get a P prime over P from the first term minus, this is just L prime squared. Now, if you take the expected value on both sides, the right-hand side, I take this whole thing, I take an expectation with respect to this P of Y given X distribution. Um, and if you look at the first term, the P cancels out, you get a P prime integral. And I just showed in the previous slide that this is zero, right? this integral is zero. So you just get this, this thing left. So what we just derived is a J, Fisher information is the negative expectation of the second derivative of the score for, of the uh, um, of the L of y given x, the, the likelihood function. So this gives us the yet the third way of writing the Fisher information. And depending upon the problem context we are looking at, you can use the first, the second, or the third way. They are all the same thing. Okay, so just this is just a summary. So if I give you a P of y given x, if I tell you to de derive the Fisher information. You can either take the expectation of the, uh, of the uh, square of the score function, take the variance of that, 
L prime or the negative expectation of L double prime. All of them are the same thing. All right, so uh, what if X was not the quantity you were interested in? And we will see some examples in quantum metrology uh, where we will see this happen. X is something that is your parameter that gives rise to Y. But what you really care about is, uh, is this uh, new parameter Z such that X is a function of Z. So F, let's assume it's a differentiable function, but it is Z that you actually care about estimating. So you want to estimate Z. So this, that's why I'm calling it Z hat of Y. But you know the functional relationship between uh, X and Z, and you can invert it to write Z as some F inverse of X. Have you heard of Jacobians in calculus? I mean, you, you probably have used that in, in a diff different context, but it's basically the idea of Jacobian. So you can write down the Fisher information for Z from the Fisher information of X with X substituted at F of Z, but you need this additional correction term, which is the squared of the F prime of Z. And we will see, we'll actually use it in some examples that we will derive together. Okay, so let's remember this, uh, the, that how you estimate a function of the parameter. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. So the first example I'll do, I think you heard this example both in uh, Carl's talk and I believe in Sai's talk as well. So I will do an example where we will look at, um, say you have a box. So I wrote this box where X gives rise to Y. Let me say that Y only takes two values. Okay, so Y is either one or zero. And it is one with, uh, with uh, probability X and say it is zero with probability one minus X. So X in this case, the parameter that you care about is nothing but the probability of Y taking the value one or zero. I want to find the Fisher information. You want to try this calculation? Okay, so let's, let's, let's say that let's start with writing a P of Y given X. So how should I write a P of Y given X? Any ideas on uh, how we might compactly write this probability distribution of Y given X? We can do it in many different ways, but any, any ideas of how you might try to do that such that, because you have to take these derivatives and so, so on to calculate these, the Fisher information. So I have to first have a P of Y given X in order to go from here to L prime and all that. Right? Cosine function. So what, what cosine function do you want to use? It, it might work. What, what, what do you have in mind? So um, how would you fold in X into that? So you need something such that this is going to give you X or one minus X if, if I substitute X equal to, um, if the value of X I substitute. I want to get one or zero depending upon whether, uh, you know, with the, with the right probability. So let me give you, actually there are many functions that work. Let me pick a simple one that, you know, that is easy to work with. So let's uh, look at that. So X to the Y times uh, one minus X to the one minus Y. Okay, so why does this work? So if you just uh, stare here, you know, if I put in the Y equal to one, it's a very trivial way. I mean, if I put Y equal to one, I get X. And this becomes one if I put Y equal to zero. What, what happens? I get one minus X. It's a very simple way. Okay, so in this case, I, um, we have to pick our one way to or the other to derive it. So we'll take the log likelihood function. So log of P of Y given X, log multiply. So Y log X plus one minus Y log one minus X. And uh, then L prime can just de de take a derivative. It's very easy. L double prime, you can also de de differentiate it one more time. And here I'm just using the third way of calculating the Fisher information. It's the negative expectation of the second derivative of L. And uh, if you take this, uh, if this thing, and you take the expectation of this, how do you take the expectation of this with respect to uh, the P of Y given X? So if you want to take an expectation of this, you have to take an expectation over that probability distribution. So what you will want to do is that with probability X, you're going to put in Y equal to one, meaning you will say Y equal to one you put here and then multiply that by X, and then put Y equal to zero, multiplied by one minus X, solve a couple of lines and you will get this answer one over X times one minus X. 
suggest you should try this. This is a very simple example. And this example is what we are going to use to derive the Heisenberg limit and uh, some very, very interesting examples of quantum metrology calculations we will do. Probably the simplest example. The next one, uh, again, I would like you to remember this. Let me write this formula down so that we can use it in the future calculation. So the J of X here is one over X times one minus X. The other one is a Gaussian distribution. So let's say Y is a Gaussian, comes from a Gaussian distribution whose mean is unknown and the variance is sigma squared. Now, if you were to calculate the, uh, the J of X from this, you will take the likelihood function and this here, I'm using the same formula minus expectation of the L double prime, I get a one over sigma squared. Now let's look at it and see if it makes sense. If the Gaussian distribution has an unknown mean and you are getting a random sample from that, if the variance of the distribution is very small, then that Y will give you X, the information about X, the mean value much better, right? Than if it's a fat distribution with a big variance. So it makes sense that if you have a small variance, your Fisher information will be high about X, but you can calculate this also very easily. The third one that, uh, this, uh, that is also, so this one we'll not use, but it's good to, interesting to note that what if the mean is known and the variance is unknown? And uh, here you can calculate the Fisher information comes out at one over two X squared. Again, it goes as one over the, the variance, uh, the square of the variance in this case. But the main difference you see between these two is that the Fisher information in this case is a function of the parameter itself. And this is another annoying thing about Fisherian estimation theory, which we have to live with, unfortunately, that the estimation precision about a parameter is oftentimes dependent on the parameter itself. So the true value of the parameter also determines how well you can estimate it. But not always, there are example situations where it doesn't appear in J of X. This one I am going to use, I'm going to write down. So it's a Poisson distribution. Have you heard of the Poisson distribution? The Poisson distribution um, and X, Y takes values over integers and X is a, um, a scalar real number between zero and infinity. And I get a random sample Y, I want to estimate the mean of the distribution X. And in this case, J of X is given by one by X. So my P of Y given X is, is a Poisson distribution. It's E to the minus X, X to the Y over y factorial and j of x for this is given by one over x. So we'll be needing this in some examples. Uh, I suggest you try out all these examples uh, yourself. They're very, very easy. You can take a picture or these slides are these rec uh, recorded so you can uh, download them and work these examples out. Okay, so a couple of important points about estimators. I talked about Fisher information. You know how to calculate Fisher information from P of y given x. The whole mechanism is there. Uh, I told you about the maximum likelihood estimator. I told you about the MMSE estimator, the minimum mean squared estimator, which is the expected value of X given Y. So if I give you a P of Y given X, give you P of X also, you calculate P of X given Y and its expectation is your optimal estimator for Bayesian. Fisherian, there is no P of X. Okay? That's the main difference between Fisherian and Bayesian. And here the maximum likelihood estimator is simply the picking the value of X for which the likelihood function is the highest. For Bayesian estimation theory, there is also a much easier estimator that people often use because this integral is sometimes hard to calculate or the MMSC estimator. What if I use the P of X information? For Bayesian, you have to somehow use the information about the prior, right? So what you can do is that um, just like the maximum likelihood estimator, you pick the value of X for which the probability distribution highest, but instead of picking the value of X for which P of Y given X is the highest, you pick the value of X for which the joint distribution is the highest. And this is called the MAP estimator or the maximum a posteriori probability estimator. Now what you can show is that, so by the way, so MMSE obviously is the best because it achieves the minimum mean squared error, but the MAP estimator is easier, much easier to write down. If I get a value of Y, you can go ahead and look up a probability distribution. You don't have to do any base rule. You don't have to do any integrals. But the very interesting thing is that when N becomes large, the mean squared error for all of these three estimators, they all approach the expected value of the one over the Fisher information under the prior probability distribution of X, the Bayesian case. So this is all Bayesian. So even for the Bayesian case, if you wanted to use ML, meaning you completely ignore the prior or you used uh, MAP or MMSE, doesn't matter which one you choose to use, all of them 
their MSC will uh, saturate to the expected value of one over the Fisher information. And what is it saying? Why is this true? Well, the reason this is happening is that as n goes to infinity, your probably your your conditional distribution of the true value of the parameter given the measurement observed you, that you're observing converges to a Gaussian distribution whose mean is the true unknown value of the, of the parameter, uh, its average value under the distribution P of X with a variance given by one over N times J of X zero. So what's happening is that the distribution of P of X as you are getting more and more and more samples is like a Gaussian that is doing this. It is moving like this with the mean going to X zero and the variance also shrinking as one over N times J of X zero at the Fisher information value evaluated at that true value of X0. So that is why when N becomes large, you can completely ignore the, the prior and it will still work. So let's do see one, this is one example. So this, by the way, this expectation of the one over G of X, uh, this people often call the expected Kramer bound or the ECRB. So I talked about the BCRB, remember that was the uh, potentially loose lower bound to the minimum mean squared error. And this is the expected Kramer raw bound, which is tracked by the maximum likelihood estimator. So this is one example I stole from Van Tree's book. And by the way, if you are if you're looking for a textbook for in classical estimation theory, this is my favorite. Uh, there's many, many good books, but I learned at least as a graduate student, an undergraduate student, all of my estimation theory from Van Tree's book. So in this example, he takes a Poisson distribution, just like I wrote over here. And he took this crazy prior distribution. So this is a generalization of the exponential distribution, but with these parameters alpha and beta or alpha and B. When you set alpha to one and B to one by mu, you get a, the, the, Poisson, the, the uh, sorry, the uh, exponential distribution. All right, so what he plots here is this is the number of samples. And uh, on the Y axis, he's plotting the root mean squared error, the mean squared error with the square root. So see what is happening the stars are the simulated value of maximum likelihood. So you're never, you're not even using the prior information. And as expected, the ECRB is tracking the ML estimator's performance. And when N becomes high, all of these estimates, the ECRB and the, um, and the MAP and the MMSC estimator's performance, which is the circles and these pluses, they all converge to the same thing is given by the ECRB, which we saw in the previous slide, right? And then if you look at uh, the, this black line, this is the actual mean squared, minimum mean squared error, which they numerically computed. And the pluses are the simulations. And see the map estimator, even though it is a much easier to calculate than MMSE, it is only a little bit worse than MMSE. So map estimator is pretty good. It is, it is much easier to calculate than MMSE. You don't have to do this integral and inversion to get P of X given Y. But this is that BCRB, that Bayesian Kramer raw bound is that, I, that I talked about. Uh, and see that this is a loose bound. It's, it's a bound to the MMSC, but it's not a good bound for in this case, uh, because there is no estimator that will attain it. The minimum mean squared error is above it. All right, so uh, for Fisherian quantum estimation theory, I'm only going to make a few notes because you have heard a lot of it from Carl's talk and Sai's lecture. A um, couple of notes. Uh, the SLD eigenvectors attain the QFI. And whenever I say attain the QFI, what I actually mean is that if you take that SLD operator, the L operator I showed, calculate its eigenvectors and use that as a projective measurement to measure rho of X, and you get a P of I given X, calculate the classical Fisher information J of X from it, it will equal the quantum Fisher information K of X. That's what I mean by attaining the, Fisher, the quantum Fisher information. Uh, so it's CFI of this measurement equals the QFI. And the SLD eigenvector measurement could depend on the parameter itself. And this is again a funny thing that happens with the SLD measurement. The SLD measurements eigenvectors themselves can depend upon the, param the parameter. So how do you deal with it then? So there is a very recent paper that addresses this issue. So if I have N copies of my density operator, my state that I want to, want to measure. So what you do is that you calculate, let's say the SLD operator and uh, you want to you know, make, start making measurements. So what you do is that you take the first square root of N copies of the density operator, and you measure it with absolutely any measurement you want that has a positive classical Fisher information. Use that measurements output to get an estimate, a pre-estimate of the parameter X. 
take that pre-estimate and plug that into your SLD eigenvectors expression, which can depend on X and use that SLD eigenvector for measuring the remaining N minus square root of N copies of rho. And you can prove that as N goes to infinity, even though your SLD eigenvectors project, uh, eigenvectors dependent on X, that you will end up achieving the QFI for that prior unknown value of X. So this is the two-stage measurement that was developed by um, uh, Masahito Hayashi a few years back. So very, very interesting result. Okay, so another thing I mentioned, Carl had also mentioned this QFI attaining measurements are not unique. Uh, and this expression is something I'm going to use a couple of times. So I will not derive it, but I will urge you to try to derive this. If your row of X is a pure state, meaning if row of X is psi X ket psi X bra, uh, you can actually write a very nice compact expression for the Fisher information. Um, in terms of the inner product of the derivative of the psi x with respect to x and the derivative mod magnitude squared of psi and uh, psi dot in psi. We'll be using it in some calculations we will do. Okay, so let's now take a break from estimation theory. We will start looking now at uh, uh, the, the quantum description of light and then we'll, we'll go from there. You now my, my research group, when my students go on for a hike, they have this, uh, they're obsessed with this thing. I don't know why they do this. They look for the perfect psi shaped cactus and they take a picture of that. <laughs> and uh, we have this repository in our group Google Drive of all these psi shaped cactuses. So, but I don't know if this where this ranks in, our, in that list. All right, so let's start with a pulse of laser light. Um, I'm going to assume no quantum mechanics here. I know you all have different various levels of quantum mechanics. This is the simplest picture of a laser light pulse um, where I first, let's say, define a mode. A mode is just like, it's a shape, it's a shape of a field. It's like a bucket in which you put some water. So I define a mode, this is a flat top mode. Um, and the mode functions always will be normalized to one. So magnitude squared of phi of t over t from zero to t is one. Once I define a mode, the only thing you need to just to, to specify, to fully specify the quantum state of an ideal laser light pulse are two things, an amplitude, a complex number alpha, and a phase theta, which is a phase reference with respect to some chosen phase reference, like a phase from some chosen reference. So alpha, um, uh, so, uh, so sorry, so alpha meaning a real number and that phase, so that's the whole thing is a complex number alpha. So square root of n times e to the j phi. Here I'm just showing schematically a coherent state. And uh, in this thing, what is buried I'm not showing is the, uh, the oscillatory portion. So there's a, um, uh, over here, the mode shape, you have to multiply by some e to the j omega naught t. So this is the oscillatory portion. If, if that doesn't change, I don't have to worry about it, uh, writing it. And this blue thing I'm showing, this is just the noise ball around the oscillatory components. If I try to measure a quadrature, I'll get some noise. I'll come to that in a second. But keep this picture in mind. With that picture, again, if I specify a mode, the only thing you need to specify for a laser light pulse is one complex number, alpha. And in quantum optics, we call that a coherent state of that mode. In quantum optics, you, the most general way to talk about light is first describe, first identify what set of orthogonal modes you want to talk about. The three degrees of freedom, space, time, and polarization or space frequency and polarization, time and frequency are just two conjugate of each other. So once you define orthogonal buckets in this three variables, then you, can, you have to talk about the quantum state of this collection of modes. If you're dealing only with laser light, all you have to do is to specify one complex number for each one of those buckets. If you're talking about statistical light, meaning thermal light, for example, then you have to describe not just those complex number for each of those buckets, but a probability distribution over those complex numbers. There's a whole field of statistical optics that deals with coherence theory. And all they are doing is this they're playing with this probability distribution over those complex numbers over orthogonal modes. Okay, so that's a coherent state. And if I were to detect a coherent state with an ideal photon counting detector, an infinite bandwidth, ideal, no dark click, unity quantum efficiency photon detector, I'm going to get a Poisson point process. What is a Poisson point process? Um, how many of you have heard about a point process before? You have taken any course on queuing theory, perhaps? Um, 
Probably not. Okay, so let me describe what a Poisson point process is. It's a very simple concept. You look at, um, so you start observing your, your light pulse starts here. Uh, if you were to feed this into an ideal detector, you will see arrivals or photon clicks, if you want to call them that, arriving at a rate given by lambda, which is the magnitude squared of, these, of, of the field, which in this case, I'm just taking to be a flat top. It is just E squared, where E is the value of the field over here, okay? And uh, constant rate, but it also has this property that if I were to slice this time into tiny little segments, let's say of segment uh, length delta, uh, say tau, then for every segment, I'm going to have a probability uh, of, let's say this is my zero to T, and I look at a small segment tau, the probability of there being a click or an arrival in this uh, segment will be lambda times tau. And probability of no click uh, will be one minus lambda tau. And uh, another thing is that the probability of a click appearing in the next time bin will be independent of the probability of, of actually whether a click occurred or not in the previous time bin. So that's all. In every little time bin, you have a probability of a click or not click, but it's an independent from bin to bin. That's all you need to derive the fact that if you count the number of clicks over the entire duration of the pulse, it will have a Poisson distribution with a mean given by the mean photon number, which is the integral of the rate over the time. So this is the photons per second, clicks per second, integrated over the time. So this is the unit of photon. So n is e squared t and n is in this notation is magnitude alpha squared. Okay, so that's the Poisson point process. So this is, as you can see with the Poisson point process, your, your rate of arrival is driven by your uh, squared intensity in photon units of the coherent state, but it's a random process. Meaning if I were to prepare identical laser light pulses and did this experiment, each time I'll get a different click pattern, but each time the click pattern will come from that Poisson point process. So oftentimes I'm gonna use this notation, a coherent state alpha going into a detector, generating a random variable that has a Poisson distribution with a mean magnitude alpha squared. Now this measurement, uh, there's no way for me to measure the phase phi, right? Because no matter what phi is, I'm always going to get the Poisson point process at the same exact rate. So this direct detection cannot measure the phase of alpha. To make the measurement of phase of alpha, there are two things I must introduce. So the one, one is uh, interference of two laser light pulses. When you take a beam splitter, a beam splitter looks like it's a piece of glass, okay? In bulk beam splitter, it's a, it's a cube. Uh, you can also buy fiber beam splitters that look like couplers, two fibers come together and then they meet each other and then they go out. Okay? So a beam splitter has two inputs and two outputs as defined by two quantities, one is transmissivity, the other one is a phase. So I'm gonna take uh, eta as the transmissivity, which is the fraction of input energy that I put at this input that goes out to this output. Meaning if the input has some energy, eta fraction of this energy will go this way, and one minus eta fraction of the energy from this input will go this way. And phase is a number between zero to two pi. A, a beautiful property of coherent states is that if I were to interfere two coherent states in a beam splitter, at the output, I get two coherent states that are completely independent of each other. Um, and it's a tensor product coherent state, and their amplitudes are given by this equation. So this is a unitary matrix multiplication, right? So beta one, beta two is multiplied by alpha one, alpha two as a column vector with this unitary matrix. So the convention I'm going to stick to is this convention for the later calculations. Um, so for example, if I were to take this example here, alpha one is alpha, alpha two is minus alpha, and let's say phi is zero, eta is square root of one half, meaning it's a 50-50 beam splitter. Then I get an alpha plus minus alpha by root two over here, which is zero, and alpha minus minus alpha over root two, which is square root of two alpha, okay? So this is uh, just showing how you can get fully constructive versus fully destructive interference. This is well known, how you can interfere two laser light pulses. Uh, you can also do more fancy things. For example, what if I choose alpha two to be some complex number beta divided by square root of one minus eta and the phase to be zero and the, amp the, the transmissivity, I take it to be say 99.9%, something very close to one. Then if you were to substitute this into this first equation, let's see what we get. Take this, this is alpha two. Let's put alpha two over here. 
the square root of one minus theta cancels. Right? So if I put alpha two here, phi is already zero. So this whole term becomes beta. And the first term, alpha one is alpha, but eta is very close to one. So I get something that is close enough to alpha plus beta by choosing eta to be very close to one. So this setup can be used to add two complex numbers. I can add alpha to beta and I can get alpha plus beta. And this is something in tomorrow's lecture, you will see how I'll use it to design better receivers for state discrimination. And this is something that was first uh, uh, studied in the context of optical state discrimination by, by, Bob, uh, by Kennedy by many years ago, 1970s. And then his former student, Sam Dolinar, who did some very, very interesting work on using this, just this complex number addition and photon detection to come up with the quantum optimal receiver to teleport between two states of laser light pulses. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna just you know, make a point that if you were to do this displacement or this addition of a complex number prior to detection, then you still get a Poisson outcome, except that its mean has now changed to alpha plus beta magnitude squared. So uh, by doing something before you detect the information bearing light, you can change the detection basis. And, and, and such changes to the detection basis is something you can has, have as a tool to, uh, for, for use for maximizing the information extraction efficiency. And again, we will see examples of that in tomorrow's lecture. All right, so what if you were interested in estimating the phase of the field, then what you do is um, you can do homodyne detection. So the way homodyne detection works is that you take that coherent state alpha and you interfere that with another coherent state that is locally prepared. And this coherent state is a very strong coherent state, alpha LO. But see, the beam splitter here is a 50-50 beam splitter. So what you get on these two outputs are two coherent states. Uh, can you tell me what are the coherent states you're gonna get at the two outputs? So you have alpha and alpha LO, and it's a 50-50 beam splitter. So if you remember the convention that I, that I wrote down, the first output will have alpha plus alpha LO over root two, right? And the second one is gonna have alpha minus alpha LO over root two. And what if I now do photon detection, that normal photon detection that will give you a Poisson outcome on both of those outputs. So what will happen is that you will get two random variables, K1 from the first detector, which will be a Poisson random variable, whose mean is magnitude squared of alpha plus alpha LO over root two. And the second one will be a Poisson random variable with a mean of alpha minus alpha LO over root two magnitude squared. And then I will take, uh, you know this, that for a Poisson distribution, if you take the Poisson distribution and uh, make the mean value very, very large, it approaches the Gaussian or the normal distribution. So it goes to the normal distribution with that same mean. And because the Poisson has the variance equals to the mean, the variance of the Gaussian is also lambda. So if you were to take K1 and K2 and pretend that they are Gaussian distributions, why can you pretend that they are Gaussian distributions? Because this alpha LO is chosen to be very large. So the mod squared of that is lambda is very large for both of those detectors. And if you write this as K and you, you scale it appropriately, you can prove that so Gaussian minus a Gaussian, you'll get a convolution of two Gaussians, also a Gaussian. Its mean value you can prove will come out to be, and this is a two lines of a calculation you should try to do yourself is equal to the real part of alpha times e to the, uh, say this is i and j are the same thing. I'm an electrical engineer. I still oftentimes would write j for an i because in electrical engineering, they, they reserve the letter i for current, uh, but it's the same thing. It's the square root of minus one. So alpha e to the j theta LO, where theta LO is the phase of the local oscillator with respect to the input alpha, uh, and the variance will come out to be one fourth. Now, this is a very interesting thing that with homodyne detection, I can get a measurement whose mean value is uh, any chosen quadrature of that complex number. Meaning if I choose this theta LO such that I can measure the real part of alpha, I can measure the imaginary part of alpha, I can measure any quadrature in between real and imaginary. But the price I pay is that no matter what I'm trying to measure, I will always have this one by four at the variance. And this variance, sometimes in the classical world, people will call that short noise of the local oscillator. Okay? But in the quantum language, there is nothing but the quantum limited noise of a single of the quadrature operator. 
so this homotype detection measurement on a coherent state is something that people often use to measure phase information, both in communications and sensing. All right, so now let's go a little bit more quantum. So I talked to you about the mode and the coherent state of a mode. There's something you can talk about is the number state of a mode or a FOX state of a mode. So remember when I said a coherent state of a mode, I said that if you were to detect photons in it, you will get a Poisson point process. You will get a random number of photons with a rate that is given by the, the, in, the intensity of the pulse. But in a number state of a mode, if I give you that same mode, that flat top, flat top mode like that, but I say I am exciting that in the FOX state one. What does that mean? If I prepare that and put it onto a detector, I'll get one click, exactly one click, no probability. Where the click will come during that zero to T, that will be probabilistic. That will be given by the, prob the probability distribution will be the, uh, the integral of the, the mode shape, which integrates to one, magnitude of phi T squared. But, but there will be exactly one photon. Now, if I give you a two photon FOX state, um, prepare that, and I detect photons with it, you will get exactly two clicks every time you do an experiment. But this time, these two clicks don't come from a Poisson point process. They don't come from a memory less process. In fact, there is a, there's a process underlying that random arrival of these photons, which I will not have time to discuss today that Horace Yuen and Jeff Shapiro, and I believe Carl had done also some work on that, uh, writing down these um, uh, Markov or that process description of, of arrival of photons for squeeze light and number states. But the main thing to remember here is that it's that exactly the number of photons will be n. That's the definition of a Fox state. Okay, so um, Fox states, they form a complete orthonormal basis for any state of a bosonic mode, of an optical mode. And a simple conceptual way to think about it is that if I give you two states, uh, two Fox states, you can tell a part between those two Fox states with probability of error zero by simply doing a photon measurement because you'll get a number of clicks and that will tell you what Fox state you had. And the only way you can have two states that you can discriminate with probability of error zero is if they are orthogonal states. So all the Fox states are orthogonal and they span all the photon numbers. So they must span all the states that uh, of a bosonic mode. Of course, this is being sloppy, but this is a good way to understand why Fox states form a basis for any state. So a coherent state can also be written in the FOC basis in this following way. And now you can see that you can interpret photon detection that I talked about as a measurement of the coherent state in the FOC basis. And as you know from quantum mechanics, the probability of the outcome N is the magnitude squared of the FOC state N with the coherent state magnitude squared, which is this Poisson term e to the minus N, N to the N over N factorial. Now, uh, if you were to apply a small phase to a coherent state, phase can be applied by a small time delay, for example, in an optical fiber or in a free space setting. So if you apply a phase theta on a coherent state, you get alpha times e to the i theta. And you saw that in the description of the beam splitter I showed you. This is a phase is simply the special case of the beam splitter when eta equal to one. If your eta transmissivity was one, it's only one phase, this is what you will get. If you apply a phase to a Fox state, would you still get a Fox state, but with the phase uh, outside as a as a term that is irrelevant if you just had a single Fox state. But if uh, you had a state where you had superpositions of Fox states, then this phase plays an important role. You don't have to worry about the A and A dagger operators because uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with quantum optics and we will not need to use these uh, annihilation creation operators in, in at least this, these two lectures. Okay, so what is a squeeze state? So you have again seen these uh, pictures before uh, but now you can understand squeeze state in terms of what it does in a homodyne receiver. So let's say I take that same homodyne receiver that I showed you, but instead of a coherent state alpha, I put in something that is called a squeeze state. Um, and remember for the coherent state, I showed this noise ball with this one fourth and one fourth. Uh, so no matter which quadrature you measure, you get this exactly the same noise variance. For a squeeze state, that noise variance uh, is different depending upon which quadrature you're measuring. So your output is still a Gaussian distribution with the, with the mean equal to the center, that complex number alpha, but your variance sweeps anywhere between one fourth times e to the minus two r to one fourth times e to the two r, where r is often termed the squeezing parameter. So this, um, this xi is the complex squeezing parameter whose real part is the amount of squeezing. And it's a phase of this is the direction of squeezing. So if I take this ellipse and turn it like that, 
that will be changing theta. So now you have two complex numbers, alpha being the center of the ball, and this xi, which told, tells you how much to squeeze in which direction the squeezing is in. Okay, so that's the squeeze state. And if you look at in the time domain, what the squeezing means is that depending upon which quadrature you are measuring, the noise ball's size can change. And you can squeeze it in different directions. You can squeeze it this way, you can squeeze it this way. This is called phase squeezing. This is called amplitude squeezing. And uh, uh, the noise ball, where it amplifies and where it shrinks, it, that changes. Okay, so um, another important thing to remember is that a squeeze state for a coherent state, the mean photon number was just this magnitude squared of the center of the ball. For a squeeze state, there are two contributions to the mean photon number. One comes from magnitude alpha squared, which is still the magnitude squared of that complex number, which is the center of the ball, that ellipse. But plus, there is an additional term, which is a sine hyperbolic squared of this R parameter. So there are two contributors. So now, even if alpha is zero, even if my ellipse is centered over here in the origin, that squeeze state, which is known as the squeezed vacuum, still has photons in it, sine hyperbolic squared R. Whereas a coherent state in the middle has no photons, even though it still has to have the one over four variance on both quadratures. So even a vacuum state, if you were to do homodyne, you will get a zero mean Gaussian variable, but a variance of one fourth, um, but it has no photons in it. Okay, so for a squeezed vacuum state, uh, if you were to write this down in the FOC basis, uh, what you what interesting thing that you see is that you only get contributions in the even photon number terms. And I will not be deriving this uh, expression, but uh, but the main thing I want you to take home is that first squeeze vacuum has uh, photons in it, um, and then it has this non-Poissonian statistics. It's very weird statistics where you only have zero, two, four, six photons, and so forth. Um, in the time domain, if you want to visualize vacuum, it has nothing, right? So there is no oscillation in a vac vacuum. It's just a flat, so that you it, that the one fourth noise ball is always there, but there is no notion of a oscillatory component even. It's just vacuum is vacuum. But notice in squeezed vacuum, it is still vacuum. Okay, so there is no um, oscillatory component that does this uh, like a coherent state, but there is still an oscillatory component with a given center frequency. So squeezed vacuum, you will have to say squeezed vacuum at 1550 nanometers or squeezed vacuum at 780 nanometers. So that determines the, the frequency with which you see this, uh, you know, that, that the quadrature variance go up and come down back from this mine one over four e to the minus two r to one over four e to the two r. And this is a coherent state. This is a phase squeeze and amplitude squeeze state. All right, so how do you generate squeeze vacuum? Well, what you do in the lab is that you squeeze the vacuum. You take the vacuum state and then you pass it through a chi to nonlinear optical process, for example. There are other ways to do it as well. And this thing is called the squeezer. Uh, again, I will not go into the derivation of a squeezer in this talk, but I'm happy to describe to you those of you who are inclined to understand how this process works. But this is just a picture from my lab. My graduate student, Alex Vent, has built a squeezer. This is how it looks like in the laboratory. It's a, we, he has a, a periodically pulled KTP crystal sitting in a, uh, in a, in a bow tie cavity. This is an oven to fine tune the phase matching conditions. And this thing generates a squeeze vacuum at a few dBs of squeezing at 1550 nanometers. All right, so why care about squeeze vacuum? So let's look at perhaps one of the earliest examples of use of squeeze vacuum. So if I take a homodyne detection on a coherent state alpha, what did I say? Let's say that alpha is a real number. I will get a Gaussian distribution with a mean of alpha and a variance of one fourth. So I told you about that. So this was a, it's a very, very simple observation. And I don't even remember who made this observation. Carl, you may remember, it was this you or uh, Horace, one, we wrote a paper that, huh, that injecting squeezing onto the vacuum port of a beam splitter, you can recover the signal to noise ratio of a homodyne receiver as if this beam splitter was never there. So what I mean by that is if I take a homodyne detection on a coherent state, the signal to noise ratio is the squared of the mean divided by the variance. It's four times alpha squared. But so if I had a coherent state beta, if I pass it through some beam splitter kappa with vacuum here, 
I would get a signal to noise ratio that will be given by four times kappa times beta square, right? Because the mean will be square root of kappa times beta, because the beam splitter will change the amplitude of the coherence from beta to square root of kappa beta. So this will be the signal to noise ratio. But if I inject squeeze vacuum into this port with enough squeezing, this thing's uh, this SNR goes to four beta squared, as if that loss never happened. This is a very very interesting observation of squeeze vacuum. You're just injecting squeezing into the quadrature that you're homolining. Um, another thing um, that you can, you know, this was also people use this to, to propose multiple applications of this. Squeezing inline squeezing. So this is the same operation I showed in the previous slide where you go from vacuum to squeezed vacuum. So if I had say a coherent state beta, some loss transmissivity kappa, and uh, I have a homodyne detector here, but this time this homodyne detector has some inefficiency, meaning it is as if I had a beam splitter of transmissivity eta followed by an ideal homodyne receiver. If I were to put a squeezer with enough gain before that non-ideal inefficient this let's uh, homodyne detection, which has a subunity mixing uh, efficiency detection efficiency product, I can recover the effect of uh, that lost uh, photons before the homodyne by having enough gain in that phase sensitive amplifier or a squeezer. So these two effects of so squeeze vacuum injection and phase sensitive amplification is something that we explored using, this was many years ago, my, my former PhD advisor, Jeff Shapiro and, uh, and his colleague Prem Kumar and, and myself and a few others, we were involved in this um, DARPA program back in 2007. And uh, in this, we were looking at um, classical laser radar using a laser light to interrogate a scene. Um, and uh, we had a, uh, a pupil through which your light was coming back was a soft aperture pupil. So it was not a hard circular aperture, it has an attenuation. And by injecting squeeze vacuum from behind the aperture, you could as if have the light coming from the scene see a nice circular aperture as if there was no attenuation. So that was the effect of squeeze vacuum injection. And we had an imperfect homodyne detection receiver, uh, which we preceded by a phase sensitive amplifier before the detector. And we were able to get much better images of, uh, of say the, the targets we were looking at with this homodyne detection radar. So anyway, so there are other, many other applications of these concepts that people have, uh, people have looked at. Okay, so let's now do some examples on quantum metrology with the tools we have learned. So we'll be using the tools that I talked about and do some examples. Uh, you have seen some Heisenberg sensitivity examples in the previous lectures, but we'll now do some derivations. This is a hike we did with Kasturi when she visited my group for a couple of um, weeks, a few months back. And this beautiful waterfall, then remember going back to that same location in a couple of months and there was no waterfall and no water over here. So Tucson goes through these cycles of rainfall. Um, and uh, sometimes you can have completely different scenery when you visit at different times. Um, so let's look at this canonical problem, which Carl had stated in his lecture, um, the conjugate phase interferometer. So I have theta by two phase on one arm and minus theta by two in the other. And I will give you a photon budget uh, in terms of an average mean or mean photon number n that you can use. So you can use it to generate a coherent state or some other state or squeeze state, whatever you want. And uh, you want to estimate the phase. So uh, with a coherent state, I'm gonna use the coherent state, let's say in this way, I'll split the coherent state on a 50-50 beam splitter. Uh, so if this alpha over square root of two gets that phase, alpha over square root of two, that gets that phase. Uh, and now this is your quantum state that encodes the phase. What would you do to find the Fisher information for that quantum state? Meaning at this point, I'm tasked with designing a receiver that has the highest sensitivity of estimating that parameter theta. So we've already learned the tools. So what will I do? I'll calculate the, uh, the quantum Fisher information. And recall this formula that I wrote down. When your quantum state that carries theta, theta is same as x, x is that unknown parameter. So that's theta here. When rho of x is a pure state, I can evaluate this, uh, this simple expression for the quantum Fisher information. So how would you go about doing this calculation? Well, 
Um, so as you see here, you're going to need a side dot, right? You have to differentiate your, coherent, your, your state with respect to X. So what you would do is that, if you remember that formula for a coherent state, um, so coherent state I wrote down as, uh, what's that? E to the minus magnitude alpha squared over two, alpha to the N over root N, N, right? So now instead here, I have alpha over square root of two. So, so that thing is four, two and two, four. And then this is alpha over square root of two. And then there's a, there's a phase. So that phase will come over here. So it's e to the i theta n over two. So take that expression. So this is not alpha, it's alpha over two e to the i theta over two. And then uh, you take the next coherent state. So I want a tensor product. So your alpha over square root of two e to the i theta over two. Um, and another one is alpha over square root of two e to the minus i theta over two. And for that, you're gonna have another summation and you will write the same thing, say with respect to m, the same coefficient, but except that now you will have an e to the minus i theta over to n. And that's your, um, that's your psi of theta. Now you can take this expression, take a derivative with respect to theta. So calculate psi dot of theta and write down those inner products, the magnitude squared, evaluate this expression, leave it to you as a homework. You should try this out. It's a very simple calculation. And uh, what you should get is k of theta equals to n for this setting. So what, what it means is that your, um, there exists a measurement such that uh, the, the variance of the estimator that results from that measurement goes as one over n times capital N, where n is the number of, um, number of modes, number of trials of this measurement that you made with that same mean photon number alpha coherent state prepared n times. Is that clear? So this is, I'm just quantum fissure information. Remember, it just tells you that there exists a measurement that will do the job, that will have that sensitivity. But now we are tasked with finding a measurement that achieves that sensitivity. So I told you that you can calculate the SLD and its eigenvectors. But that's very hard for you to describe to an experimentalist. Like what, what does it mean to, calculate, to do that experiment, the projective measurement defined by the SLD eigenvectors? But in this case, it's actually not a hard to design measurement. So what we will do is that we'll just recombine the two coherent states on another 50-50 beam splitter. So now you can do this math in your head. I don't need to write it down. So this is alpha, that coherent state here. Add these two and subtract these two. What will happen? You will get a cosine and a sine, right? So you just take these two coefficients. So this plus this over square root of two, this plus this, this minus this over square root of two. Now I have two detectors. They will both generate a Poisson random variable whose mean is given by n cosine squared theta by two and n sine squared theta by two. n is mod squared of alpha. Okay, so now how I need to calculate the classical Fisher information of this measurement because I've not specified the measurement. You have a random variable. So you have P of Y given X already. I now need to calculate what is the Fisher information. So what's the first step? Well, take a look here. We wrote down that the Poisson distribution with an unknown mean, the Fisher information is given by one by X, right? So the estimating Lambda one from Z one, Lambda one being let's uh, say a parameter, which is the mean here, this is the Fisher information. And then I also told you this uh, Jacobian rule. What if I don't care about Lambda one? I actually care about theta. So I want to calculate the Fisher information of theta. It will be equal to the Fisher information of lambda one times the, the, the squared of the derivative of, uh, uh, of this function, f, f1 of theta uh, with respect to theta squared. So if you do this math, again, just a couple of lines, you will get j1 equal to n times sine squared theta by two. Is that clear? So I'm just calculating the Fisher information for estimating theta from the Fisher information for estimating lambda one using that Jacobian rule. Now, similarly, the Fisher information for estimating theta from Z2 is given by n times cosine squared lambda theta by two. You can calculate that using the same method. And because these two measurements are statistically independent random variables, their Fisher informations add. And if you total, find the total Fisher information for estimating theta from both of these, you can add these to Fisher informations, you get n again. 
which is really cool, which means that now if I were to write down the minimum maximum likelihood estimator on Z1 and Z2, my variance of the estimator is going to go as one over NN, which is exactly what the quantum pressure information did, which means in this particular case is that this measurement is a quantum optimal measurement. Is this the projection onto the SLD eigenvectors? It is not. Okay, this is a different measure. I can write down the quantum description of this measurement. How I can take the FOC basis, go backwards to this beam splitter, it will be a crazy looking measurement basis. It's not the SLD eigen measurement basis necessarily. So, but it achieves the QFI nevertheless. All right, let's take another example of uh, something called a noon state in the literature. It's a very, very well-known state in the context of quantum metrology. In fact, one of the earliest examples of uh, quantum limited sensitivity for estimation, phase estimation that came with, described with, with respect to a noon state. So noon state, but, but I will pretend N is an integer um, and uh, that there's a Fox state with photon number N. So this has a mean photon number of N, right? Um, and then I will um, uh, have the state of the output. I remember I said that if a phase acts on a, Fox state, it gets this uh, phase in front of the Fox state, but now I'll get two different phases, either the I theta by two, because the Fox state hits this mode uh, and this Fox state hits that mode here. Now you can do the same thing. Go ahead and calculate the, the quantum pressure information. In fact, you will find this calculation a lot easier than the coherent state one. So the psi dot, you're just going to take this, see you'll differentiate with respect to psi, you will get a, I n over two e to the i n theta over two, you'll get a minus i n over two e to the i n theta over two. Do the differentiation, do these inner products. And if you do the math, you should see k of theta will come out as n squared. What does it mean? Well, it means that there exists a measurement on this output such that the variance of the estimator will go as one over n times n squared. Little n is still the number of copies of this state. So this is what is you know, called the Heisenberg limited sensitivity. Um, in this case, I will not show an actual example calculation of a receiver, even though that same interferometric receiver for the coherent state actually works in this case also. But I just wanted to show you something a little different. I will define a measurement by these two projectors, where these two projectors, oh, I didn't even write down these projectors. So psi one, I intended it to be, psi one is n zero plus zero n over root two and psi two is n zero minus zero n over root two. Now these two are mutually orthogonal states and hence describe a valid quantum measurement. And then if you were to work out the probability of getting the one outcome or the two outcome, you will just take the magnitude squared inner product with respect to the noon state. Um, and you get these two formulas, cosine squared and sine squared n theta by two. Now, what do we have here? So we have exactly that setting that we derived earlier. You have little n copies of a Bernoulli random variable with a parameter P, which is the parameter that you care about, but not quite. You don't care about P, you actually care about theta. So you have to still use that Jacobian, right? So first question is that, how do I calculate the classical pressure information of this measurement? Well, the first thing is that recall from that formula, over here on the board, that the Fisher information for calculating, for estimating P is one over P times one minus P. We just derived that for the Bernoulli random variable. But then if you want to estimate theta, so the J of theta is given by J one of this J of P times this, uh, this mod squared, the Jacobi and F prime of theta, where F prime of theta is just the derivative of the functional form of theta, P written as F of theta. Take this, differentiate that, square that, multiply by this thing, do a couple of lines of math, you will see J of theta equal to N squared which means that this particular projective measurement achieves the quantum pressure information. Um, and uh, again, it shows that the classical Fisher information of a measurement, again, just like the previous example, equals the quantum pressure information, which means that this measurement is optimum or one of the optimal measurements. And hence the maximum likelihood estimator at the output will achieve that same scaling. All right, so let's look at using a squeeze light probe with the same mean photon number. In this case, I will not have the mathematical tools to show you the full calculation, but this is the example which I want to use for some photonic sensing applications that I will talk about afterwards. 
Okay, so now if I take a squeezed vacuum state with a, with a squeezing parameter squeezed this way, and a squeezed displaced squeeze state with a mean of alpha and a squeezing parameter of uh, xi, the same squeezing parameter, I'll get a state here. I calculate the Fisher information. This also goes as n squared. Okay, and in this case, um, the measurement that works to achieve this uh, is a homonine detection measurement on only one of the quadratures after you put it through a 50-50 beam splitter. So if you do a homodyne measurement, write down an estimator. If you calculate the variance of this estimator, you will get the variance of the estimator to be go as one over n squared. And here we arrange the squeezing such that the total mean photon number of these two squeeze states is equal to n, capital N, just to be fair in my calculation. All right, so this, this was used by my former student, Michael, in uh, designing a quantum enhanced fiber optical gyroscope. So gyroscopes are a device that can be used to measure you know, acceleration, for example. So yeah, in a normal gyroscope, you have a laser gyroscope, you have a laser going into a long uh, loop and you do homodyne detection. And in this case, uh, he injected squeezed vacuum through a circulator and then looked at some applications of that, uh, not just with a single mode squeeze vacuum, but extensions of that where you split the squeeze vacuum into multiple modes to get an entangled state and get further better performance. But again, I will not go into the details of this calculation here. Now, the moment you have loss in any one of these sensing examples, what happens is that this uh, Heisenberg limited sensitivity goes away. So see the variance of the noon state or the squeeze state transmitter, they go as one over N squared. The variance for the coherent state transmitter goes as one over N. But if you have loss, then what happens is that it starts scaling like the quantum case for low mean photon number. And when you go to high n, it becomes parallel to one by n. So basically there is no Heisenberg limited sensitivity as a scaling law for large n. You always go back to one over n scaling for the variance, but you can still get a good constant factor improvement in the variance using quantum resources. And how much improvement you get depends upon how lossy your system is. Okay, so the last example I want to do um, is uh, the magnetic field sensing with two level atoms. Uh, and in this example, it's a very, very simple example. You have a state of a qubit, zero plus one over two root two. And uh, as a function of time, you get, um, uh, you get a, 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 time varying, um, a time varying phase being applied to it. And what you want to estimate is, the, uh, is theta, meaning the rate at which this phase is oscillating. Okay, so this theta is what you care about. And what you can do is that if you take the state and make a measurement in this 45 degree rotated basis, you will get a Bernoulli outcome again, P or one minus P, this, these two probabilities will be the plus outcome or the minus outcome. It's very easy to calculate from this, right? How would you calculate from this? You will take a plus inner product with the psi of T magnitude squared, you will get this formula, minus the state inner product with psi magnitude squared, you will get sine squared theta T by two. So we know that the Fisher information is given by that formula again, one over P times one minus P. And uh, apply the Jacobian again, your J of theta will come to T squared. So what it means is that the variance of your ML estimator will go as one over little n times T squared, where little n here is the number of atoms that is, let's say, sensing the same magnetic field. So each atom is being subject to the same field, and you want to write down the variance of the estimator for estimating that, that that parameter theta, which is the rate of oscillation. Now, what if you had these n atoms that were initialized instead of all of them in the equal superposition of one and zero in this G8Z state, or what Carl called the cat state, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you will get that phase e to the i n times theta times t in front of that term. And again, you can do a measurement on this in the logical plus minus basis meaning these two uh, vectors. And you will get again a Bernoulli outcome, but with a probability cosine squared theta n t over two and one minus q. And again, I'm use the same formula. My j of theta will simply come to be n t bank total uh, squared. It is like I'm doing the same calculation as before. Like j, if you look at this here, uh, uh, this j of theta is t squared where T was this term over here, um, and, uh, and the T appeared in the, in the Bernoulli dis probability distribution as cosine squared theta T by two. So if I replace T by NT, 
the, J, the whole calculation is the same. This becomes instead of t squared becomes nt times whole squared. And because I just had one copy of this state, I don't need a little n multiplying outside. My ML estimator will be just one, one over j of theta. So it's n squared t squared. So what you see here is that the main difference between the previous slide is that the t squared is the same, but that n has become n squared now. So this is the Heisenberg limited sensitivity of field, field sensing. Okay, so let's see, I am now at 3.30. Three, uh, um, and I was, I'm going to talk about network of sensors and how do I create these atomic sensor networks and a couple of examples of that. So what do you think, should I stop here or um, go for another 15 minutes this section? Um, and uh, what's, your, what's your preference? Uh, yeah, that's, that sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. If you want to take questions at this point, uh, so my plan for the next part here is to talk about uh, not just a single sensor. If you have multiple sensors working together towards one task, um, then uh, uh, how, uh, that how can entanglement among those sensors gives you a better sensitivity. And then I'll show examples of such sensor networks for magnetic field sensing, for RF photonic sensors, for things like long baseline astronomy, and one example in multiple spatial modes that are entangled for higher precision beam deflection measurements. So I'm, my talk is going to get more and more and more applied as I go towards the latter parts of my talk. But any questions? Yeah, so questions? Uh, uh, sir, I, uh, I have a question with the uh, with regards to the estimator section. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about uh, how the Fisher information may or may not depend on the variable. So uh, is that uh, dependent only on the type of distribution you have? Or is there anything else that may... Uh... There's nothing other than the type of the distribution. Um, in general, the Fisher information will, will be a function of the parameter. Uh, when it is not, is what I consider as the special case like that Gaussian distribution with an unknown mean and unknown variance, sufficient information is one over the variance squared. But I would say that is more of a uh, exception than the rule. Typically, Fisher information is a function of the parameter. You will see one more example in my talk tomorrow uh, on quantum limited um, estimation of the separation between two stars. There also you will see Fisher information does not depend on the parameter you care about, but that's a, uh, Mostly it does. Uh, mostly it does, yeah. And also the uh, basic question regarding the um, squeezing of light. So you talked about the noise ball, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm uh, it, how I understand is that when you squeeze the light in, uh, towards one quadrature, mm -hmm. so the uncertainty increases in the other in orthogonal the other quadrature. Uh, quadrature. Right. So the noise ball is is that the uncertainty is is the uncertainty. That noise ball is, it's like that, that diagram I had, the coherent state, oscillatory component and the noise ball's vertical length was the same, which simply means that if I did the homodyne detection, no matter which uh, quadrature of the complex number I'm trying to measure, real part, imaginary part, I'll still always get one fourth as the variance in the photon number units. Mm -hmm. For a squeeze state, as I'm going through that zero to two pi oscillation, mm -hmm. some part of the zero to two pi oscillation, I increase it, it means that the, the other orthogonal quadrature must squeeze. squeeze it. So it goes like this. Got it. Thank you. Okay, sir, uh, you have talked about uh, 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 a squeeze, you said, has an uh, even number of photons mm -hmm. that mathem mathematically. So can you give a physical intuition why? Uh, we get only uh, even number of photons. Physical intuition. Do you have an answer, Sai, to that? I, what is the physical intuition for the squeeze vacuum, squeeze around the real quadrature to have only even number of photons? It is quadrature dependent. I'm trying to, so his question is a physical reason for why. Uh, okay, I can give you not for squeeze vacuum, but you know, there is another state that I did not talk about. It's called the, uh, have you heard of the term cat state? Yes, sir. So if I take a coherent state alpha that I wrote down earlier, so e to the minus mod alpha square over to alpha to the n square root of n factorial n. 
if I define a state alpha plus minus alpha with whatever normalization constant I need in order to make it a unit norm state, what will happen if I write this state? Can you see what happens here? When I take minus alpha, I have the first part of this sum remains the same, e to the minus mod alpha squared by two, but here I get alpha to the n plus minus alpha to the n. This state is obviously not a coherent state, this is not Poisson. But if you see these terms, they are, um, uh, they, are uh, they go between zero and non-zero for odd and even, right? So when, so this term is minus one to the n times alpha to the n. So when n equal to one, this is negative, so it cancels out. So it only has even components. But now this, I did not give you an answer for a squeeze vacuum, but if you look at the Wigner function of the, this particular cat state, there's a very strong resemblance with the squeeze vacuum squeeze along that, uh, that Q quadrature that I had drawn. But I don't know, the short answer is I don't have a very good answer to the physical intuition for why you have. Uh, one other way to think about um, you know, squeezing the first paper that introduced squeezed light um, was a three-part paper in 1979 to 1981 by Jeff Shapiro and Horace Yuen. Uh, they did not call it squeezed light at the time. So if you look at the title of the paper, they called it two photon coherent states. Now their reason for calling it a two photon coherent state is that the squeezing Hamiltonian, um, if you write down the unitary of the squeezing operator, it looks like this. These are the field operators. And this is a annihilation of photons twice and destruction of a photon twice. So that was the reason why they called it a two photon, um, uh, two photon coherent state. And it was Carl Caves who started calling it squeeze state because of its picture in the Wigner space. Mm -hmm. But that is another way to think about why uh, the squeeze state has an uh, uh, even number of photons if you were to work out the Fock basis elements, uh, because a squeezed vacuum will be simply applying this operator to vacuum. Okay, and if you work out the application, so now if I have an e to the n operator, I will have to write it as you know, the usual Taylor series, a square over two factorial and so on. Take this, do this thing and apply it to vacuum. And you will be able to see that you will get zero and then two and four and six and so on. The middle things will cancel out. This is the closest I can come in terms of physical intuition. Hope that's um, good enough. Thank you, sir. Four, three, four, five, okay. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned about SVI and PSA mm -hmm. techniques. So I was wondering if there is a threshold for the squeezing parameter that you actually need to uh, see uh, the independency from kappa and if it's a good question there is no threshold it's a smooth thing right so for kappa to completely disappear your r will have to be infinity or your eta for the homodyne ineffic inefficiency to completely go, go to one your phase sensitive amplifiers gain has to go to infinity but obviously that is not the case in an experiment so in that experiment we had 6 db of squeezing for the squeeze vacuum and something like 2 db of squeezing for the psa so we just reduced it the, uh, the, the, the effect of that inefficiency in the homonine receiver and hence improve the quality of our image in the experiment. So it is as if I have a homodyne detector with a detection efficiency of 70%, but as if my information bearing light is seeing a homodyne detector of 80% efficiency. So that was the effect that we had seen, but there is no sharp threshold. It's a smooth effect. Okay. Hello, uh, sir. So for uh, the coherent state of light, uh, the it follows the Poissonian statistics. Okay, so it has a probability distribution function, and uh, the squeeze state of light it follows the sub Poissonian statistics, so where the variance is less than the mean. So does it have any analytical distribution function, just like the uh, coherent state? Oh yeah, of course, of course. The squeeze so, light's fox, uh, fog distribution. I don't like writing that. It's a not a very there's a distribution to write down, but I, you can find it in textbooks. It involves the Hermite polynomials. 
Okay. But definitely, yeah, there is a nice closed form expression for that distribution. So the thermal state also has that kind of distribution. No, the are... thermal state's photon distribution is a what is called the Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay. So that is, a, or in the language of statistics, it's a geometric distribution. But uh, and the coherent state has a Poisson distribution. Thermal state's photon distribution is a geometric distribution. Squeeze state's number distribution is a much more complicated looking distribution with thermite polynomials in it. Sir, so if we converse the uh, coherent state and the thermal state, do we get the uh, uh, subposonian? So coherent state and thermal state, they are both classical states. So if you mix them, let's say on a beam splitter, what you will get is a displaced thermal state. In fact, on the two outputs of the beam splitter, you will get a classically correlated Gaussian state with a non-zero mean, which will okay. not be a squeeze state. A squeeze state is a non-classical state. So if I put a squeeze state through a beam splitter, you will get an entangled state on the two outputs. And that's what I'm going to go into the next part of my talk on quantum sensor networks. Uh, but with a thermal state and a coherent state, you can, all kinds of things that you can generate with that and linear optics, with beam splitters, are states um, that are only classically correlated, not entangled. Okay. I think I saw a question there. For the measurement, you have chosen the specific projectors. Uh, what is the reason behind that you have chosen specific uh, projectors and that is uh, also in entangled basis that psi one and psi two have chosen. oh the, the for the noon state example i showed yes yes i just show picked just i just picked one measurement basis just to show that that measurement cfi equals the qfi just to show you an example like when you are finding optimal receivers oftentimes for many problems in communication sensing i work with it's, it's actually art, art slash intuition, finding optimal receivers. Quantum tools, they give you a good measurable value of this is the best you can do. But from there, finding how do you design a measurement that achieves that, there is no one recipe. So I just wanted to show one example calculation. For the coherent state one, it was very obvious as to why we should have used that beam splitter. For the noon state example, that measurement was the obvious because Noon or not noon, meaning the, up the, the orthogonal state n0 minus 0 n, um, it was the obvious one to, uh, to get that phi because that phi appears in a Bernoulli distribution probability, yes. which is something that is easy to estimate. But other than that, there's no real intuition behind it. Thanks. But an actual measurement that will achieve it, actually a beam splitter followed by photon detection would have achieved it. I just did not want to do the calculation because interfering Fox states through a beam splitter is much more difficult to do in us in this setting. But just wanted to say that there are many, many uh, measurements for the same problem that will achieve the QFI, which are not even sometimes the SLD measurement. Uh, sir, uh, my question is regarding the experimental schematics that you've shown, uh, where the you've placed two phase differences after the beam splitter, mm -hmm. uh, phi by two and minus phi by two. Mm -hmm. Is it always necessary to have phi by two and minus phi by two? No. That, uh, was, will... that was just one example. The phi by two and minus phi by two example, this is uh, people who call it a conjugate phase interferometer. Yeah. Conjugate phase interferometer comes about in a Sanya loop based fiber optical gyroscope. Okay. Okay, but if you have a phase only on one arm, that also is fine, like the um, LIGO example that Carl talked mm -hmm. about. But uh, will the calculations change significantly? With the not problem? significantly. Not significantly. No, you okay. can, in fact, I, but you can try the calculation with mm. just theta on one arm mm. with a coherent state. And I think your pressure information for that instead of N will come out to be 4N, if I remember correctly. Okay. But try it out. It's okay. a, it will go as always proportional to N. Okay. And with a squeeze state or noon state, it will go as N squared. Okay. The constant will change depending upon your exact setting. Uh, and so one more question. So uh, you've shown the Fisher information in terms of uh, the derivative of psi and also psi. Uh, I mean, it isn't in, in the form having these two things. Correct. Yeah. Some places have also seen it uh, being represented as the variance of the Hamiltonian. Yep. Where the Hamiltonian so how are these two related? How are they related? Very good question. You must have noticed in my talk, I didn't have a Hamiltonian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was directly asked writing row of theta, row of mm -hmm, x. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where did row of x come from? In a real sensing setting, uh, well, I should not say real sensing, there are two types of sensors. One is passive sensors, one is active sensors. Mm -hmm. Like when I take this phone and take a camera, a picture, this is a passive sensor. Mm -hmm. I'm not sending any light. Yeah. But I can still write down the quantum state of the photons that I'm collecting. I'll show some examples tomorrow of such passive sensors. There, you will oftentimes just write the quantum state based on your physics of the imaging system. Okay. 
But then if I'm sending a laser light probe or a squeeze light probe for a beam deflection measurement or uh, for the LIGO interferometer, mm -hmm. there I can describe the action of that measure of, of that physical um, uh, metrology tool mm -hmm. to my probe. And that action physicists would often write as a Hamiltonian, so E to the IHT, uh, where T is the time duration over which you're acting upon mm -hmm. the state with that mm -hmm. Hamiltonian, that's a unitary. Mm -hmm. Now, e to the i h t, that h will depend on that theta, yeah. right? Yeah. And e to the i h t applied on the state psi zero will give you your final state, which you can then think as my psi of theta or rho of theta. Mm. You calculate the variance of the Hamiltonian. Mm. It will match the formula I gave you if you were to write that on psi of theta. Okay, got it. Sir. Okay. And just one last question. So uh, in the part that you showed that you were experimentally generating the squeeze state, so mm -hmm. you said that you actually squeeze the vacuum. So uh, basically, according to me, I mean, you're not sending anything in. So, okay. I mean, through okay. the crystal. Yeah. So what exactly? What exactly am I doing? Yeah. There? Okay, very good question. So that's the whole, that could be a subject matter for a whole uh, two lecture series. Um, uh, nonlinear optics. Mm -hmm. Okay, classical nonlinear optics. There are many processes like down conversion, yeah. some frequency generation, difference frequency generation. Uh, so the process that we are using in my lab is called the spontaneous parametric down conversion. So what happens there is that there are three frequencies involved. So let's say there is a pump frequency. Mm -hmm. So pump frequency, if you, and there are two more frequencies, I call the signal frequency and idler frequency. Yeah. So I put nothing in the signal and idler. I put vacuum in signal and idler. Okay. Pump, pump, I put a strong coherent state. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do the classical nonlinear optics of the mm -hmm. input output theory, the, mm -hmm. solve the Maxwell's equations in a bulk chi 2 medium, yeah what you will get is that you will get a coupled mode equation in terms of the amplitudes of all these three modes, of the okay. three, okay, three frequency mm -hmm. modes. If you look at those coupled mode equations, you will see that if AS and AI, the complex numbers corresponding to the signal and idler frequencies were zero, mm -hmm. the output AS and AI should also be zero. Yeah. Meaning if I don't put light yeah, yeah. in those two frequencies, I should not see any light in those frequencies. Yeah. And the pump stays the pump. But in the lab, when you do the experiment, you actually see light in those signal and idler frequencies. Okay. So then like, what's happening? The classical nonlinear optics is not describing it correctly. Mm -hmm. But then if you take those discoupled mode equations connecting ASAI in and ASAI out, mm -hmm. you put hats on those A's and make them annihilation operators. Right. Then the whole thing becomes a two mode Bogolyubov transformation or a two mode squeezing transformation. Mm -hmm. And we know that a two mode squeezing operator acting on vacuum vacuum will give you a two mode squeeze state. Yeah. So, but then you might still ask, where did the photons come from? Mm -hmm. You just told me that squeeze light has photons, mm -hmm. but I did not put any photons in those. That cannot happen. Physics not allow, doesn't allow it. So the photons obviously came from somewhere. They came from the pump. pump yeah. But the pump is 10 to the six times stronger than the, than the squeeze light that is coming. So the pump depletion is very negligible or we assume it to be very negligible so we say that we are operating in a non-depleted pump regime okay in that case you can think of that as squeezing the vacuum okay but if your pump is not strong mm. then the depletion from the pump has to be properly taken into account yeah and then that three mode hamiltonian gives rise to very interesting non-Gaussian characteristics that somebody with Wolinsky, Carmichael, and many others uh, quantum optics studied. But you can generate these interesting non-Gaussian states. But the regime that most people in the community use this is in the non-depleted pump regime. Okay, uh, so the non-depleted pump regime will give you the single photon. I mean, usually SPDC is also used for generating single photon sources. Well, single, that's a, so yeah. single photons is a byproduct that people do after that. After so, the thing. All SPDC sources. In fact, I was visiting uh, uh, Professor Uvashi Sinha's lab this morning, yeah. and we were discussing exactly this topic. Every SPDC and spontaneous photo mixing source in the world, what comes out is a two mode squeeze vacuum. Okay, okay it says, okay. and two mode squeeze vacuum, if you write down in the Fock basis, mm -hmm. it's a superposition of zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. Right. If you turn your pump power down, mm -hmm. your two, two, three, three, four, four are very small. Yeah. So what people do is that they stick a detector in one of the two modes. Mm -hmm. So if the detector clicks with high probability, the other mode has one photon. So they use the SPDC as a means to generate a single photon. Other people use single photon emitters like color centers and diamond to generate single photons through a totally different physics. Mm -hmm. 
But SPDC, the raw state is always squeezed light. Got it, sir. Thank you. All right. So I think we can take the rest of the questions out for coffee. So it uh, sounds good. Sounds good. So you can have a chance to interact with them. We don't have too much time. We are running a little late. Uh, round of applause for. Uh, thank you. We'll be back.